Thanks to our title sponsor, Extra Hop, for making Research Saturday possible. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CyberWire's Research Saturday. I'm Dave Bittner, and this is our weekly conversation with researchers and analysts tracking down threats and vulnerabilities, solving some of the hard problems of protecting ourselves in a rapidly evolving cyberspace. Thanks for joining us. I guess in its kind of you know rawest definition, it's really just uh, infrastructure that is used for malicious purposes. That's Jason Passwaters. He's COO at Intel 471. We're discussing their research on bulletproof hosting. And now, a word from our sponsor, ExtraHop, securing modern business with cloud-native network detection and response. The massive shift to remote work has turned the reality of work on its head. With cloud and multi-cloud adoption, comprehensive visibility is more important than ever. But in order to protect your business, you need more than unified visibility. You need intelligence response workflows so teams can collaborate easily and act quickly. Thanks also to our sponsor, Verizon, who for nearly two decades has helped secure data, networks, and infrastructure of many of the world's best-known organizations. Their annual data breach investigations report is considered the gold standard of cybercrime research, and Verizon's leadership in network, wireless, and IoT connectivity makes it uniquely capable of protecting the ever-expanding attack surface. Let Verizon help you optimize your defenses and achieve the maximum return on your security investments. Learn more at verizonenterprise.com slash products slash security. But the folks that run the service are doing things to to help from defend against takedown and, and make it more resilient. So they can hide the infrastructure, they can keep it up and running longer, um, and then they can make adjustments if there's any kind of um, you know takedown attempts. But Bulletproof Hosting as a service is kind of broader in the sense that they provide anything from uh, domain registration, server administration, you know stuff like that, help desk, um, as well as most services now are providing not only like back-end infrastructure, but also a front-end kind of reverse proxy net that serves as a protection layer. So it's kind of a more of a broader uh, or a larger business model. Hmm. So in, in the past, if someone wanted to do this sort of thing, they would tend to uh, roll their own and, and find someone who'd be willing to let them hose their own server up to the internet? Yeah, I mean, Bulletproof Hosting has been around, you know, since cybercrime has been around. Um, if you go back to the mid-2000s, uh, there's some of the same actors there's, you know, in the game today were back then doing the same. And they would just have their infrastructure in hard-to-reach places and you know, hard-to-identify um, different things they were doing to kind of hide things. Um, and over time, you know, with takedowns, with kind of things that have exposed how they operate, they have evolved and made changes. Um, and that's why you see kind of that, like I said, that two-sided setup where they've got the back-end infrastructure and they'll have a reverse proxy net or some kind of botnet that sits in front as well. Well, let's go through some of the things that you've covered here in the research. Um, one of the highlights here is you, you talk about the power of fast flux. Can you take us through what exactly does that mean? Yeah, so the fast flux has been around for quite some time and um, essentially what it's doing is there's two di- there's two types, main types. The first is kind of VPS based on um, basically, you know, servers that are set up with different providers and the bad guys will, you know, leverage automation to rotate IP addresses across, um, sorry, the domains across that pool of IP addresses. Hmm. Um, they've got another type. Um, it's more bot based. So malware infected machines are acting as, you know, kind of proxies and they'll rotate, you know, the domain names that are associated um, across all of those IPs at some, you know, high frequency uh, to help add some resilience to identifying the infrastructure and take down and stuff like that. 
Help me understand, because they're, they're rotating these quickly. I mean, a matter of minutes, right? Yeah, in some cases it could be minutes, but in the case of, you know, when you have somebody that's doing more, you know, what, like one provider specifically abuses cloud, uh, you know, cl- cloud providers, and he maintains a huge pool of IP addresses and he'll rotate the domains at different frequencies. And they won't necessarily be super fast, Um and it might be as long as that instance stays alive until the uh, provide you know the cloud provider identifies it and takes it down, and then another one takes its place. Um, in this, in the case of you know fast flux, when there's bots involved, um, they're actually having a small time to live um, on the DNS record side, so that it automatically changes. You have a pool of IP addresses that are you know within seconds. You know. I, could be 90 seconds, it could be a little bit longer, changing across the entire uh, botnet. Hmm. Well, help me understand, would, wouldn't they have um, issues with, with, with propagation, with the, the domains, you know, the, the propagation of the, the alignment of the domain name with the IP address? Wouldn't there be a lag with that, or is that not really an issue these days? No, I don't think it's an issue these days. And, you know, um, that time to live helps with, you know, the propagation um, you know, as far as how DNS works and stuff, so mm. it, it's it's been pretty uh, resilient. Um, it's been around for a while. They really have two versions on the bot side. There's double flux, and then there's um, just regular fast flux. The double flux is even, uh, I guess, more resilient because the name servers themselves, uh, off that you're asking basically for resolution, also are on the botnet as well. So you've got no, not only the bots that are kind of you know. Dealing with the A records, which is domain to IP mapping, but it's also the NS records, which is the name servers used to kind of resolve it. So they're also kind of fluxing as well. So it makes it uh, twice as twice as hard sometimes. Hmm. And, and this is a tough one to stop. Yes. Yep. Very much, especially when you know. Right now, I think there's only one actual double flux hosting kind of framework that's out there for bulletproof hosting that that we're aware of, and. Um, they leverage kind of hard to reach places as far as you know core infrastructure and and even the bots that are on the kind of front end if you know if you will you know you don't see them as much in like the United States you don't see them in you know Canada and and different countries you'll see it a lot in you know you'll see it in Ukraine and Romania um, mm. and the purpose is just to kind of proxy back to to the kind of back end. Well, and and I mean that transitions into sort of the the physical location of the the data centers themselves, which is a a big part of that. I mean they're they're setting these things up in places that uh, have a certain amount of uh, flexibility when it comes to law enforcement, I suppose. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's there's kind of a range. Um, you know, you'll have some providers that are just don't have the the capabilities to respond, and you know they're not necessarily bad. Um, or, or partaking in the activity, they just don't know and they don't know how to respond if they do figure it out. Um, mm-hmm. And then the full other side would be more providers that are actively kind of, you know, they have their quote data centers. And we've seen a couple of those where they have their own, you know, all their own core infrastructure, um, even down to having their own AS, autonomous system number, um, their own prefixes and, and, and companies that kind of associate um, with this infrastructure. And so what can the rest of the online community do to try to tamp this down? I think it's it's really, you know, tracking this kind of activity, the you know, the threat actors associated with it. The way it can be beneficial is if you can map out the infrastructure and tie it back is is you kind of go back from a, a single domain or a single IP address and you can go up the chain to a you know, a net block or a prefix, a whole group of IP addresses. You know, if you've associated that with, say, a bulletproof hosting service, you know, you've got kind of swaths of, of um, space that you can, you can block or alert to um, once you have a confidence in that kind of linking back to a, ser- a malicious service. And then to be proactive, I mean, you could, you could look at the AS level and proactively monitor BGP messages to identify new prefixes or new blocks of IPs that come up under that infrastructure um, when it happens, and then um, proactively kind of alert to that if you see it on your network, instead of just kind of whack-a-mole with single IP addresses sometimes. Um, the the proxy, the reverse proxy net, or the, the fast flux stuff, it's a little bit harder. It is you know going to be single IPs, and um, 
you know, if you have more, if you have vendors, you know, obviously that can provide that kind of stuff. Um, it would be more advanced type tracking and research to kind of see that. Can you give us a sense of the the kind of spectrum of offerings that are out there? I mean, are, are there varying degrees of, of bulletproofness, you know, depending on uh, what people need? Yep. Um, it depends on basically what people need as far as the activity they're doing. Um, you know, if they've got some very noisy stuff that is going to be, you know, maybe high bandwidth needs, and uh, you know, they have solutions for that. If they're going to need just, like I said, that kind of protection layer, you know, let's take a ransomware blog, for example. You know, they mm-hmm. might hide it behind one of these, uh, these kind of fast flux setups. Now, if you need core infrastructure, say C2 infrastructure that, you know, needs to sit on an actual server somewhere, um, you'll, they'll have backend uh, hosting for that as well. And that'll typically be in hard to reach places, you know, that we've seen, um, you know, obviously Russia, you know, uh, parts of Ukraine or East, Eastern Ukraine is a big one sometimes because it's it's a bit of a contested area right now and hard to reach. Um, and I think it's Transnistria between Moldova and uh, Ukraine. That's that's a popular place as well. Hmm. Yeah, folks have other things on their minds, I suppose, than than chasing down these servers. Yep. Yeah. So to what degree do these have the attention of law enforcement? I mean, we, we, you know, there's this story not long ago about the cyber bunker, which was a very, you know, dramatic kind of, of thing. I mean, are there takedowns of these? Is, is this, a, like so many things, one of those games of whack-a-mole? Well, I, you know, I think it definitely is on the radar of law enforcement. Um, you know, every time you see the same infrastructure pop up or the same kind of core infrastructure pop up with different stuff. It's, it's tough to, I think, quantify the significance that say something like a bulletproof poster might play across cybercrime in general. Um, so that's tough. Um, but I do think that there is attention. There are takedowns. I mean, there's a number of takedowns that have happened. Um, you know, Avalanche Botnet was one, um, one of the uh, bulletproof hosting ser- services in Ukraine, So Sweet, that was another one. And it's interesting because when you take down a core enabler like this or you, you impact a core enabler, it has a reverberating effect across different aspects of cybercrime. And what happens is even in the kind of marketplace that, that we watch and track, you'll see that, ta- you'll see that kind of manifest itself with... Uh, with the service themselves doing damage control, you'll see it with other hosting providers, you know, malicious hosting providers providing, uh, you know, specials and um, basically hmm. saying, "Hey, sorry for my competition's uh, situation. We feel for him, but we're offering a, a special." Um, and mm-hmm. then you see it with actors that are complaining because when infrastructure suddenly goes down, you know, everybody starts to complain about why I can't uh, access my servers or why all my ops are are pretty much uh, paused. Um, so it's interesting to see that. So you see that kind of wider effect. And I think the the point is that um, when you affect a core enabler like this, it has deeper, probably more uh, lasting impact. Do the different providers have, you know, varying degrees of, of reputation, like, you know, are some known for their, for their uptime? You know, the, the things that you would see in, in normal hosting, do all of those apply to these folks as well? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, reputations are maintained in the marketplace. Um, you know, if you don't have support personnel that are interacting with the with the the market um, and the clients, um, you're going to get dinged for that. Um, if uptime and is bad, you're going to get dinged for that. So it's just like any other kind of hosting uh, service. Um, it has all the same challenges. You know, from dealing with customers and clients to scaling the business. You know, you name it. Our thanks to Jason Passwater from Intel 471 for joining us. We'll have links to their research on bulletproof hosting in the show notes. Thanks to ExtraHop for sponsoring our show. You can learn more at extrahop.com slash cyber or connect with them on Twitter or Facebook. Our thanks to Verizon for sponsoring our show. You can learn more at verizonenterprise.com slash products slash security. 
The CyberWire Research Saturday is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our amazing CyberWire team is Elliot Peltzman, Peru Prakash, Kelsey Bond, Tim Nodar, Joe Kerrigan, Carol Terrio, Ben Yellen, Nick Vilecki, Gina Johnson, Bennett Moe, Chris Russell, John Petrick, Jennifer Iben, Rick Howard, Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening.